So my next speaker, as I load this up, is uh, John Furlow. John uh, works for uh, USAID. It's the U.S. Agency for International Development. And for those of you who have never heard of USAID, uh, maybe you just recall seeing USAID's logos on bags of grain that are being uh, distributed around uh, worldwide locations for relief. Uh, but USAID does a whole lot more than that, uh, and they have a whole reason for being. And with that, I'd like to introduce a, a wonderful video that was produced for USAID's 50th anniversary, uh, which goes back to the founding of USAID, and then we'll continue with uh, John's presentation. Let's take a look at that video. Today, okay. we seek Can you to turn move the beyond the accomplishments of the past, to establish the principle that all the people are entitled to a decent way of life. This is the most demanding goal of all. We have made a good start on our journey, but we have still a long way to go. The conquest of poverty is as difficult, if not more difficult, than the conquest of outer space. And we can expect moments of frustration and disappointment. But we have no doubt about the outcome. For all history shows that the effort to win progress represents the most determined and steadfast aspirations of man. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. So I'll start with a little bit of an overview. I can't be as dramatic as the, as the video, but um, USAID was, uh, is the US Agency for International Development. Um, as the video said, uh, we were set up in 1961 um, with President Kennedy's speech. Our legacy goes back to the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe after World War II. <clears throat> and uh, today, we operate in about 100 countries. We are. Um, I guess last year, the State Department, USAID, and the Defense Department worked together on a, a trilateral um, diplomacy, defense, and development uh, foreign relations uh, strategy. And so the, the role of development is being more widely recognized in the administration, I think, globally. Uh, and much of what we've seen in, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan following most of the fighting has been trying to rebuild, and that's what aid does. Here's some of the things that we work in, and a lot of these you'll see are uh, areas that Tony and Eileen talked about as being sensitive to climate change. Um, our climate change program, our goal is to help countries develop. We are an international development agency, um, but we also want them to develop cleanly and robustly so that they're resilient to the impacts of climate change and we want to help them minimize their uh, contribution to the problem. Um, so we have programs in mitigation. Uh, we have a program called Low Emission Development Strategies where we work with countries to help them develop their own economic growth plans, but to do so in a way that minimizes their emissions, both from the energy sector and from land use, farming and, and uh, land use management. Um, we have a very, what I think is a very neat program there where we match private finance with people with ideas and we have coaching sessions. It's called the Private Financing Advisory Network. 
um, people with an idea for, you know, if you want to put a wind turbine on your farm or something, um, you can come in, present the idea, and these finance coaches work with you to put the plan, get it sort of off the napkin and into the format that a bank can look at. Um, and we are leveraging billions of dollars a year to try to get uh, private money moving into developing countries where it uh, often doesn't find its way. What we're talking about mostly today is adaptation. Um, so we want to work with these countries that are already uh, often quite vulnerable. Now they're dealing with new impacts of climate and, and variable weather, and we want to help them build resilience as they grow. Um, did I skip one? No. Uh, this is where we work in adaptation. We're in about 23 countries. Our budget in 2011 was about $139 million, and that's we try to invest in ways that enhance our other investments or host countries' investments in, uh, in general development projects. So some of the challenges to adaptation in developing countries. Eileen and Tony talked about some of the challenges in the United States. Imagine that in a place where you have some of the problems that have kept these countries from developing already. Very low levels of education. Um, in some cases, weak or poor governance. Very low levels of health. Um, uh, diseases like malaria, AIDS, other things, nu uh, poor nutrition, and then either non-existent or very weak infrastructure. Some of the, the climate challenges that we face are very poor historical records of the weather, um, very poor current weather data. Often the only weather station in a country will be at the airport. Uh, yes, the airlines need the information, but so do farmers, and people don't generally farm at the airport. So getting information uh, about the places where people are trying to sustain their livelihoods is important. It's often very difficult. Um, Tony talked a bit about the uncertainty in some of the climate models. A lot of these places are already very poorly adapted to the current environment, current uh, weather conditions, the weather conditions of the past. And so changing those conditions out from under them uh, just makes their, their lives and, and pursuing their livelihoods uh, more difficult. Um, so what we're dealing with, with climate change and cli climate variability is really a change in the operating environment that these countries operate in. Um, generally in developing countries, their econom economies are very dependent on the weather and the climate. <coughs> Most depend heavily on agriculture or tourism, things like that. Uh, this is a graph of Ethiopia going back to 1982. Um, the, let's see, the pink line, I'm not sure how well you can see it, is agricultural GDP, the blue line is overall GDP, and the yellow areas are rainfall variability around the mean. In Ethiopia, about 70 to 80 percent of the people are farmers um, or derive their income from agriculture. Agriculture accounts for about a third of the GDP. Um, as you can see, when you have good rain, ag GDP and overall GDP go up. When rainfall comes down, so do uh, so does GDP. This is uh, 1984 was the year of Live Aid and the, the massive um, starvation problem in Ethiopia. Uh, there was a lot of other things going on then, but certainly the failure to, to be able to bring in crops contributed greatly to the problems then. And you can see it continues. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. What was the good thing that happened in 2000? Can you repeat that? Uh, the question was, what was the good thing that happened in 2000? Yeah, I've seen, I've, this is from the World Bank, and there's a more updated one, and it does come down later. There's just a lag. I believe it comes down uh, about a year later. Um, in 1985, USAID, which provided a tremendous amount of uh, relief food during the, the food crisis in Ethiopia, the question came up, why can't we predict these things? Why can't we anticipate that these problems are going to happen rather than just flying in food aid? Can we do something anticipatorily to, uh, to try to mitigate the problem? Um, we created the famine early warning system, which is joint with NOAA, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, and other groups. Um, <clears throat> this is a snapshot from the fourth quarter of 2011. You can see in the Horn of Africa there are a lot of food problems still. Um, the darker color is emergency, um, and the orange is crisis. This is a snapshot. I don't expect you to read it all, but um, this is just to show that Ethiopia is still facing these problems. 
Um, Eastern Horn, is, Horn of Africa has experienced two consecutive seasons of significantly below average rainfall, resulting in one of the driest years since 1995. Um, crops have failed and on and on. Um, I believe it's getting a little bit better. This was from June of last year, and there was not a newer update. So I think that may mean that at least for Ethiopia, things are getting better. I did not grab the, the report for Somalia, which I believe is more dire. Um, this is just looking back. If you go to the, the FuseNet webpage, it's Fuse, F-E-W-S dot net, um, you can get the historical uh, alerts for each country that it serves. It serves about 25 countries, and you can see that this is a, you know, when there's a problem going on, they update it pretty regularly, and then, but you can see there's a pattern going back of bad rainfall, bad livelihoods. So what do we do about this? What is adaptation? Eileen gave a definition. Um, here is a fairly technical IPCC definition. Um, basically what it means is that to us adaptation is a process of understanding um, the stresses that you're vulnerable to and then figuring out what you can do to reduce the impact of those stresses. Um, we are a development agency and so we want to, with the adaptation funding, we want to find kind of the nexus of things that are a high development priority. We want to address high climate risk but we also want to um, and make our investments in areas where we're likely to succeed. Um, there we go. This is an approach that we've developed to try to embed our adaptation investments in development priorities. So if you talk to, we've tested this in a few places, we bring together a group of stakeholders from the private sector, from the government, national government, local governments, and talk to them about what drives the economy, what are the development priorities in a country. This is an example um, from somewhere in the East Caribbean. Tourism dominates, um, manufacturing and construction are important, and agriculture is important for cultural reasons. Um, not a big part of the overall GDP. Then we ask, what are the things that have to be in place for you to achieve those outcomes that you want? Um, what are the inputs or the conditions that you need? If you are a Caribbean island, then the natural environment draws in the tourists. They want to have a fresh drink of water and a hot shower. Um, they need energy for that. They want to be able to get to the, from the airport to the hotel. They want to be able to move around. They want to be safe, um, and so on. Then we talk about all of the stresses that they confront in these areas, um, climate and non-climate. <coughs> so in the Caribbean last year, they were coming out of a bad drought. Um, so they, were, they had fire risk. They had uh, water rationing. After that, they had massive flooding, so they face both. Um, it's getting hotter. As Eileen and Tony both mentioned, that affects corals, uh, which is what draws the tourists. They're dealing with sea level rise, which affects the infrastructure. Non-climate things are corruption, pollution, et cetera. Then we talk about interventions. What can we do to alleviate these problems? Um, we want to look at all of them because, as Eileen said, some problems, uh, you know, Barbados, St. Lucia, Haiti, wherever, aren't going to do anything about ocean acidification on their own. They're not going to change the overall atmospheric carbon, uh, carbon profile. They can get people to stop touching the corals. They can look and if they notice that a golf course is dumping, is, uh, the runoff from a golf course is putting fertilizer or pesticide onto the corals, they, can do, they might be able to do something about that. So we want to find the problems that are tractable and address them. And if there's an overarching problem that can't be addressed, then we may have to move on to another challenge. How do we assess vulnerability? Eileen mentioned this as well. We like to talk about it in the sort of the context of the three little pigs. Um, first, we want to ask, is an asset or a, a process exposed to climate variability? Um, is something exposed to flooding? Is it on the coast or is it uphill? Um, agriculture is very exposed. The three pigs were each equally exposed to the wolf. Then we want to talk about sensitivity. How much does that exposure matter? If your house is right on the coast, but it's built up on stilts, it's going to be less sensitive to flooding than if it's built right on the ground. Um, we want to see if crops are, are suitable to the range of temperatures and precipitation profiles they may face. Um, the last element is adaptive capacity. This is kind of the human element of these things. Um, can you anticipate changes that are coming? Can you do something about them? The, the smart pig was a mason. He built his, brick, his house out of brick, so he was more resilient to the wolf. Um, 
in this context of farming or in developing countries, how much access to information do farmers have? What options do they have for switching crops? What can they do about harvesting water so they can get through a dry spell? So we want to reduce exposure and sensitivity and increase adaptive capacity through our programming. This is kind of bringing that first slide about priorities together with that sense of, uh, with the, the elements of vulnerability. So again, what are your objectives? You want to in improve health, you want to improve uh, productivity or food production. There are some of the inputs, infrastructure, water systems, freshwater availability, ecosystems. What are the stresses? Um, Non-climate might be poor infrastructure maintenance, pollution, lack of regulation. Climate ones might be higher temperatures or increasing rainfall variability. Then we can break the elements that are important down and put them into the context of the elements of vulnerability, which helps us then understand where we want to reduce vulnerability. We want to consider if we don't do anything, what might happen? What are the negative impacts? And then we want to look at options for reducing those impacts and hopefully get a better outcome, which would lead to achieving our overall objectives. Um, one of the challenges in developing countries, just like here that we've been talking about, but probably more so in developing countries, is getting good information to people who can use it. Um, NOAA, the UK Met Service, the German Climate Service, um, a group at Columbia University called the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, aid and, and uh, the World Bank and some others had a meeting in October to talk about the delivery of climate services and climate information for decision making. Out of it, we formed a climate service partnership. Um, there's growing consensus that getting this information to people can result in better decision making. Some of the principles are tailoring information to decision maker need, really getting, uh, treating it as almost a customer service relationship. What do you need and how can we provide it to you in a, in a form and format that will make sense? Um, in developing countries, we want to focus on important development sectors. We want to provide open access to data. We, have, uh, we did a project in West Africa where we looked at, for examples of climate services, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. This is, um, these are two pictures that I took about 90 seconds apart. Um, this is standing on the bank of the Niger River at the Hotel Gawe in Niamey, Niger. Um, I was just taking a picture of how low the water is. I lived there a few years ago, and the water went from, you can see there's grass and stuff out there. This is the John Kennedy Bridge. Um, during the rainy season, they sometimes worry about it flooding that bridge. Um, so you have massive change in the water level. I didn't notice, and you can't really see it here, but there was a little cloud of dust here. I walked into the hotel, walked upstairs, and it was pitch dark. Um, a storm had come out of the east. Uh, it was the first rain of the season. The sky went black. Um, it looks red in my picture, but it was, you couldn't see more than about 15 feet. Um, and that was followed by about six hours of just unbelievable rain. And that's the way the rainy season begins every year. So farmers need to know when that's going to happen. They don't want to put their seeds in the ground before that first rain. They also want to know if there's going to be another one like that a week later, because if they get excited and go plant thinking they've got a little bit of moisture uh, and another rain like that comes, again, it'll wash it all away. Um, so in this workshop in West Africa, we talked about climate information as a value chain. Um, and we tried to flip the perspective of one of being uh, supply-driven to one of being demand-driven. So first, you need to understand your user needs. Who is your audience and what do they need? How can you translate that information for the people who need to use it? Um, in West Africa, the communication infrastructure is poor. Probably the vast majority of farmers can't read, so a written statement won't work. Radio is very popular. Um, then you've got to get the information to people. Uh, they need to know what to do with it. And then hopefully, if you get all those links in the chain together, you'll get better decisions. Um, this is an example of a, an information tool that the IRI at Columbia um, developed with the Red Cross for West Africa. It's a flood warning. Um, this is a, obviously a, a global precipitation forecast. This is a, this is a pretty well-communicated thing. IRI worked very closely with the Red Cross to develop these questions, which I'll put up bigger in just a second. 
The first iteration of this was in meteorologists speak or climatologists speak. Um, I think the first forecast was something like there is a 30% probability of above average rainfall in an area in the next six days. And the Red Cross disaster folks said, we don't know what average is. We don't know what you're talking about. So they have worked. I think this was the seventh iteration back and forth between the two, and they put it into simple questions. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but how much rain is expected in the next six days in this area, <coughs> cumulatively? Where is it expected to be wetter than average? Is a lot of rain, if you're not familiar with a place, you don't know what's a lot or what's a little. So what's above average? Um, where is unusually heavy rainfall expected, and how heavy is it expected to be? They used this um, for the first time in 2008, uh, the for with the forecast, they were able, the Red Cross was able to preposition supplies. They were able to request visas. Um, they were, the forecast was for flooding in northern Ghana. Um, they could request visas. They could uh, preposition supplies. They could request funding, relief funding from the public. Um, and they cut the response time by a couple of weeks. And they uh, cut the number of uh, deaths and dislocated people dramatically. Um, Aid and NASA worked together on an information product that developed, was developed for Central, Air, Central America as a, an environmental management tool. It's called Servir, which in Spanish is to serve. Um, I'm just going to give one example of this. We're, we're, we've now expanded it to Central America, um, East <coughs> Africa, and uh, the Himalayan area. This is an example of it being used for um, a response to Hurricanes Gustav, Hannah, and Ike. This is Haiti. This is the city of Gonaive over here. Um, and you can see there's a road here. And if you're thinking about how to get relief to Gonaive, you might think, well, we can drive it in on that road. But with the satellite imagery, we could see very quickly that um, the road was flooded. So they had to figure another way out. Um, NASA and AIDS, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and other relief agencies work closely on these things, um, on this product, to get information out very quickly um, to, to improve responses and also provide anticipatory uh, information. This is a little tool that um, my team developed with a group in upstate New York and with help from the National Science Foundation. Um, we would tell our, our field offices that they needed to get to think about future climate change, but we weren't telling them where to get it. And we realized that that wasn't very fair of us. Um, in some of our pilots, we worked closely with, um, with NOAA to get the information, but that's not something that our field offices can do very easily. So we just mapped um, historical weather information and projections from, I think, the previous IPCC report onto Google Maps. And you can stick a pin in the map and uh, tell the tool what kind of information you want, historical, rainfall, or um, temperature, or projections. We also have some derived products, um, I think soil moisture, stream flow, I can't remember what all. This is showing um, the pin is, looks like it's probably in Niger. And uh, this is historical temperature from 1901 to 2001. This is from the um, East Anglia Climate Research Unit database. There are, I shouldn't say this, but there are probably better tools like this. The World Bank has one. The Nature Conservancy has one. But um, we, haven't, we haven't invested enough to keep this as good as it should be. But uh, it's, I have a soft spot in my heart for it. Um, last thing, I talked about how do you communicate this information to farmers in very poor countries. Um, there's a guy named Mohammed Bulaya that Dave and I both know. Some of you may know him as well. Um, he was the head of the Algerian Met Service, and then he started a program based in Niger to develop the capacity of Met Services in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he realized after a while that forecast uh, capability was improving, but nobody was getting the information outside the capitals. So he came up with an idea for um, these rural radios. Each station gets a satellite radio, and... Uh, each, the community has to build the station. Um, aid or another donor, the UN, um, provides the equipment and the, the tower. Um, the community has to provide a, a basically a DJ. Um, they listen to the satellite radio, get information from NOAA or um, Europe about the weather, and then they rebroadcast it in local languages. 
this is out in the middle of the Sahara, um, but they have, a, they have this broadcast booth and they can broadcast in about a 50 kilometer range. So there are some efforts to get information out to people and it's spoken and it's in local languages. So it's, um, it overcomes some of the literacy challenges. So next I wanna talk a little bit about um, index insurance. This is something that's clearly uh, uses your products. Um, index insurance is being tried mostly for farmers. The idea is that um, rather than looking at damages, insuring against damages, you insure against a weather event. And this, uh, so the farmer can basically get paid twice. If there is a drought, the index might be, if there's no rain by June 1st, it triggers a payment. Um, <coughs> if the farmer has stored water or comes up with a faster maturing crop, if it doesn't rain until June 15th and he, 15th and he can still bring in a crop in a shortened season, it's fine, he still gets his payment. Um, so it's a neat product and it provides the farmers with uh, a little bit of wiggle room in their income in case something doesn't work. They can try a different crop, try something different and get away with it. What we're trying to do is pull together a, a package of uh, tools for farmers, um, risk reduction, better on-farm practices, things they can control, risk retention. A lot of in a lot of developing countries, there's no opportunity to save any money. There's no banks for um, very, in small communities. Um, so we're trying to bring in savings and things like that. Risk transfer is the insurance. And then for very major, rare, hopefully, but big disasters with big losses, there will always be um, relief efforts. So last time I'm going to talk very briefly, I promise, about another project we had and then show a movie. Should I go ahead and show it? Um, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, finish up here, and then we'll show the, the video going into the book. Okay. Um, as things have gotten warmer, a lot of glaciers uh, are melting and turning into lakes. Um, they're held back by sometimes unstable terminal moraines, earthen dams, and they pose a risk to downstream communities. And so we had a project that we did a few years ago in Peru with the National Science Foundation um, looking at changes there and really changes in water use in Peru. Out of that workshop, several people asked if we could do something similar in Nepal, in the Himalayas, and take Peruvian engineers who have about 30 or 40 years of experience managing these lakes in the Peruvian glaciers, take them over and let them talk to and teach the Himalayan, the Nepali um, engineers and, and governments what they do in Peru to manage these lakes. So we took about 35 scientists, um, folks like me, and then we had a couple of journalists that went with us. We trekked from, we trekked up to uh, Imja Lake, which used to be Imja Glacier about 40 years ago. Um, this is where we camped. You can't see it, but that's, I think, that's the terminal moraine. Um, that might be Island Peak, um, and Everest is back over that way, I believe. Um, it was a great trip, and uh, after the break, or during the break, we'll show a... We can show it now, it's really flexible on the... <coughs> you sure? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that was very clear to me on this trip um, was that this is a very hard place to work. Uh, if the altitude here is bothering you, we were um, at about 5,000 meters. That lake is at about 4,900 meters. So getting workers up there is difficult. It took us about eight days to walk there. Um, nobody got sick from the altitude, but it was not easy. So the idea of having people construct something to shore up that dam is quite challenging. The workers would have to acclimate for probably a couple months. And all the materials have to get carried up on someone's back or on a yak. There's no road, um, which is why we walked. So that was a little bit daunting when we thought about what to do. So should we go to the movie now? Can we go to the film? Can we get a little bit of the set? The 1985 August, Zatarism, the Dukizudi, the Nihozo, 
तो पानी मत बार बत्केरा पच्ची टुंगा रो कश्यरा एका पास पास जुद्देरा तब एको मुसी जस्ता गाना है पूरा तब मत ये लाने चाहिए वो तुम ये यार सा सिवा सो दुगला पटी सो दिस रोज़ ना एम्स सो दिस इंजीनियर बुकन सो मैंने ताई नीचे तो कुछ मेरा उसी दे ताई नीचे आना तो कुछ ऐसे उन पुष्टि दे ना ना सेम ना जीवा दिवा सो ना New and potentially dangerous glacial lakes and glacial lake outburst floods are becoming a growing problem throughout the mountain world. As the world continues to warm, glaciers all over the world are receding, often leaving behind in their place a large lake such as the one behind me. Now, 50 years ago, this lake was a glacier. All I would have to do is to walk 10 feet this way and I would have been on top of the Imja Glacier. But starting in about the 60s, 1962, the glacier started to recede year by year, growing, growing, leaving behind a lake in its place. A lake which today is more than a square kilometer in size, has more than 35 million cubic meters of water, and continues to grow at an alarming 35 meters per year. This is the fastest growing lake in Nepal, if not throughout the entire Hindu Kush Himalayas. So the Peruvians have more than 50 years of experience in controlling and managing dangerous glacial lakes. And we think that this is an experience that needs to be shared throughout the world. That's where we got the idea to bring not only Peruvians, but glaciologists, glacial lake specialists, and social scientists from more than 13 countries around the world here to Nepal in the field to work with local people to try and find solutions. What is different from this expedition is we're not just holding a conference in a city and publishing proceedings and all going home. We're actually bringing these 31 scientists to Nepal, trekking through the Kumbu, the Mount Everest area, up to Imja Lake to actually study the lake, be at the lake, exchange experiences and collaborate in terms of ideas, in terms of how to control and manage these glacial lakes. This is a uh, group coming from very different countries, Asia, South America, the US, Europe. And the common goal is to understand these lakes, share what's happening in our different countries, and that's happening already. And it was just fantastic you know, to see uh, Angrita uh, talking to Cesar, who is the glaciologist from Peru, and Rita from Nepal. It was just sparks coming out of the conversation. This is just the second day and uh, if everything follows like this, it's just going to be very interesting, very powerful trip. meters and it's the first time that we get to meet a community. And what was interesting to me at the meeting with the community yesterday was the perception that they've been left out of a lot of the scientific discussions. What we want is a result, not a problem. Yeah, we know there was a problem, but we need our solutions too. So what is the next step? So what can we do? To this point, they have sort of been left out of the communication loop. So there seems to be a strong need to translate or synthesize that very technical information so that they can really begin to understand the situation with the lakes. What we would like to do is invite uh, as many of you as possible up to our camp so that you are part of this dialogue from the very beginning. We as scientists, both uh, natural and, and social, must be seeing ourselves as being at the service of the communities and not the other way around. now made it to Imja Lake Base Camp. We're camped here at about 5,000 meters. We're pressing on to the lake today. We will conduct interviews, talk to local people, and start to unravel some of the questions about Imja Lake. Oh, yeah.
We are standing on one of the lateral moraines. In 1964, the ice surface was something like this. So you can imagine, you know, how thick the ice was and how rapidly we got the uh, melting. With the ice core of these moraines and their melting over the next few years, it could totally change the landscape that you see behind us with these moraines, which is holding back the lake water. So it's necessary to try to get an idea of how the evolution of this landscape may progress over the next five years or so, because in five years it could be much more dangerous than it is now. We've also had a lot of uh, opportunity for our colleagues from the Andes, from Peru, to observe the uh, situation here and to think about their long experience in dealing with managing these lakes. One of the best things that we can do is to enable them to work with the community here and to study the, the problem here and to help the community come up with solutions. It has been a good experience for me to see the lakes in uh, Nepal and from uh, the experiences we shared with the group of uh, people from different countries here, I could use some of their techniques in like studying the lakes in Bhutan as well. Sharing of their experience has been quite well, fantastic to us. Perhaps we are going to manage our glacier lakes and diffusers. As we go back down towards Kathmandu, the group is going to continue talking about what more do we need to understand in terms of the social structures here, the political structures, and the physical structure of the lake and what might be done. It's been great having the Peruvians, the Central Asians along to bring insights from those other regions and help us learn what might work here in Nepal. Thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting me here. This has been great. And um, if you have any questions, you can either email me or there's information on the USAID webpage. I would recommend with the URL that long, Google whatever you're looking for. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a lot quicker. That's what I do. Um, and uh, like I said, we had two journalists um, on that trip. If you're interested in going on any, seeing any of our projects firsthand, get in touch. Uh, we'd love to, to have you along. Thank you. Great.